Hey guys, thanks for the short wait. My name is Mark Itelli. Welcome to Cup of Fern Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. Uh, today we have Tina McIntyre from Seminole Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences from the University of Florida, and she'll be discussing integrated pest management. I just have to go over a few of our chapter announcements because we have some outreach that is coming up that may be of interest to you. So Florida Native Plant Society is the conservation, preservation, restoration of native plants and native plant communities here in Florida, as you probably know. Uh, if you are a member of Coupler Firm, please go ahead and report your volunteer hours for this uh, month. Uh, volunteer hours can be something as easy as working from your home. If you're attending this meeting, this actually uh, constitutes as volunteer hours as well, believe it or not. Just go to our website, click on the icon, and follow the instructions. Uh, if you are a Seminole Master Gardener, uh, continuing education hours do qualify towards your, I believe it is 10 hours per year, maybe a little bit different. Uh, but our education programs each month do qualify towards your continuing education Master Gardener hours. So feel free to use them accordingly. A uh, couple of fern is the FNPS chapter of the year. So in case you haven't uh, heard the good news, uh, we just got awarded by Florida Native Plant Society State, the chapter of the year. We're very thankful. This actually comes right on time for our 10 year anniversary. It happens to be a watershed moment. Uh, we have special member experiences coming your way throughout this year, just as a way of thanking you for being a member. Um, we're actually doing a special webisode, which is called the 10-Year Time Bank. Uh, Susan Angermeyer, Barbara Whittier, Nita Villalobos, Bell, uh, and Christine Brown will walk down memory lane with us and share a special slideshow of pictures spanning over 10 years, just to preserve those memories and kind of uh, ring true for our 10-year anniversary. Um, and Nita, speaking of Nita, she's back in her outreach. So she's doing a Zoom presentation with the Seminole County Public Library System. It's a free webinar on Saturday, August 1st at 10 a.m. In case you're interested, more information can be found through Facebook on our Facebook page as well as on our website. You need to pre-register, so please pre-register if you think this program might interest you. It is an introduction on Florida native plants in case you have friends and family or loved ones that are interested, don't know anything about Florida native plants. This is a great introductory course, but pre-registration is required, so follow the information on Facebook or on our website. Uh, we're doing another free program just in time for our 10 year anniversary, and this one's called Native Plant Starter Pack Ideas, and we're doing this Saturday, August 8th. It's free for everybody, no pre-registration required for this one. Uh, it'll be available on Facebook and our YouTube channels, and this is just our way of saying thank you so much for being a member. Uh, we are having a plant sale, so in case you are thinking about uh, gardening and updating your yard during this slower time uh, during COVID-19, uh, we are practicing very safe measures, limited uh, number of people allowed uh, at a plant sale, at the plant sale event, I'm sorry, at any given time, masks must be worn. And uh, as a nod to added social distancing as a convenience, a couple of firm members can pick up their pre-orders on August 14th between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. So that is going to be at the Sanford Garden Club, and that's August 15th. As a matter of fact, our starter pack ideas will actually talk about some of the plants that you can find at the plant sale as well. So uh, listen in on the starter pack idea discussion and then come out, come out to our plant sale and support our little nonprofit that way. Uh, refer a friend and family member to Couple of Fern today. So simply go to fnps.org, click the join button. I've actually put a red arrow there, just as simple as that and you can become a Couple of Fern member and celebrate our 10 year anniversary with us. Uh, recorded videos, so for some of the most online uh, recent experiences are still available. Go to the President's page, there's well over I think 30 uh, webisodes at this point covering uh, a native plant artist to uh, carnivorous plants, to gardening, to other issues. Um, so in case you've missed any of them, please uh, remember that they're still available on the president's page for you. Upcoming, we are doing a, uh, actually we are not, but 
the University of Georgia, and we are promoting it, is doing a free webinar on tree identification procedures. And that's going to be July 27th online at 10 a.m. In case you're interested in this wonderful uh, webinar, you must pre-register and pre-registration only opens 30 minutes prior to the 10 a.m. start time. So at 9.30, you will go and follow the instructions and the link is provided on our chapter website. Follow it and register. Tree identification procedures should be a very interesting uh, presentation and it's uh, courtesy of University of Georgia. And upcoming also uh, next month, our monthly program is Seminole Natural Lands Program and SISMA and Overview. We're having Allegra Beyer from Seminole Natural Lands and Amanda Lindsay from the UCF Arboretum present on this. And it'll be again online and it'll be August 10th at 7 p.m. And tonight, we have Integrated Pest Management for Florida Gardening with Tina McIntyre. Uh, she's not a fish and wildlife biologist. I apologize for that uh, glitch there. She is a seminal IFAS, Florida-friendly landscape uh, agent, and it's tonight at 7 p.m. Thank you so much, and I'm going to turn it over to Tina. Hey, Tina. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, Mark, and congratulations to your chapter for getting that 10 year um, anniversary and hitting that milestone of getting the chapter of the year. That's just awesome. I'm so happy for you guys and thank you for having me tonight. So I'm going to be talking to you about managing yard pests responsibly. Um, you know, getting those native plants is a great step to fostering good beneficial insects. So we're going to kind of cover here tonight, um, various aspects. So we're gonna talk about the consequences of overusing pesticides. We're gonna look at specific pests and identifying those insects. We're gonna talk about University of Florida IFAS recommended integrated pest management. And that's a big one when we're talking about pests. We're gonna look at common landscape pests and diseases and some management strategies to help overcome those. So for those of you that are new to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, we operate on nine principles. And so one of those nine principles is managing yard pests responsibly. Um, the other nine principles, you know, we, we really look to have good water quality. So even though it's a, a landscaping program, I always say it's a landscaping program um, with the, the mask but really it's a water quality program. We wanna be um, you know, using our landscapes properly so that we can have clean waterways and protect our waterways. And you know, properly utilizing um, and managing our pests is really important part of that. So I just wanna start off by um, showing a quick video. I hope that it's optimized um, for video showing. It seems like it is based on our intro here, but uh, let me just, Get this um, going here.
Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of start off the video, you know, start off the presentation with, you know, just really setting the tone as to why biodiversity is important and, you know, why we should care about these insects in our yard. So that was from the Smithsonian Institute magazine. And, um, you know, really they did quickly highlight the, you know, the chemicals and the different um, maybe pesticides that we have and we utilize in our landscape and how that can upset the natural balance between the pet predator prey. Um, and that, you know, they showed the charismatic megafauna of the, the gray wolf, but actually that exists on the, the small insect level as well, where we have predator insects and we have prey insects as well. So, um, you know, this really causes unnecessary environmental contamination when we do routine spraying. And so University of Florida IFAS does not recommend a routine blanket pesticide application. Um, you know, and we'll get into the details of how, how can we better, you know, do a better job. So applicator experiences um, also increase exposure. So there can be damage to the human that's constantly applying these pesticides. And it may also cause phytotoxicity to plants. Um, and I just wanted to throw this out there that feel free to put in the chat any questions. Um, we're happy to, you know, it's up to Mark if we want to answer them along um, the way or wait till the end. I'm happy to answer any of your questions as well. So looking a little deeper at the consequences of, you know, pesticides. Well, the cycle of pesticide dependency. So researchers are, are really coming into understanding um, pesticide resistance. And so many chemical pesticides are a broad spectrum, meaning they kill a wide variety of insects. Um, so it's not necessarily killing the targeted pest that's bugging your house or your tree or, you know, the, the target of your, um, you know, of your wanting to, to, to fix it. So um, we, it eliminates several natural pests and it could even um, inhibit the beneficial insects that we see in the landscape. So basically we're getting rid of those natural controls. When we're just getting rid of every bug in the landscape, um, you know, we're taking away those ladybugs and, you know, predator wasp or, you know, green lace wings and different beneficial insects. And we can have a dependence on those chemical pesticides. And we also can see antibiotic resistance, or sorry, the pesticide resistance. So um, basically here on the left, you can see, you know, a little bit more of a, a balanced system where the ladybugs are maybe eating the pests. But then after a chemical treatment, we have, you know, less pests. We also have less ladybugs. So in the, in the days following a pesticide treatment, pests reproduce faster um, than the predatory insects. And by killing those beneficial insects, the pest population actually flourish. Um, higher than before the treatment. So in some instances, in a long-term perspective, it can actually um, inhibit the natural balance um, like we saw in the video. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna define pests. So pests might be any organism, organism that's un, in an unwanted place. Uh, less than 1% of all insect species are known as plant pests. So that's, that's quite a... a small amount um, when, we, when we think about the grand scheme of all insects. Most plants in urban landscapes are oversprayed and homeowners apply between four to 10 times more pesticides per acre than farmers. So we are seeing a higher amount of pesticides applied in, in the urban environment. So we wanna start with identifying what the, what the pest is. We wanna know what what's going on in our landscape. So there's good bugs and there's bad bugs. We wanna learn the difference between those predators and those prey. Not all insects are pest plant, um, pests of plants. So um, predators might be beneficial insects that actually control the population. So many of you are probably familiar with the lady beetle and the lady beetle larva, maybe not so much, um, but the larva ultimately will grow up into a full reproducing ladybug. So we don't want to, you know, accidentally think this is some pest or maybe a stink bug or something that's going to harm our plant when it's going to actually be a, a beneficial asset to our landscape. So we want to think about the environmental stressors. So Florida Friendly, you know, thinks about the landscape from a big picture perspective. And 
really, um, we focus on cultural practices. So we call cultural practices are things like, you know, the, the height to which you might mow your lawn or the way in which you might prune your tree or the way that you water your yard. Um, a lot of those cultural practices can actually enhance um, or deter the, the pests, insects in your landscape. So uh, many environmental effects are actually mistakenly treated as pest problems. So things like you know, drought or nutrient deficiency, uh, variations in pH, um, mechanical damage, cold damage, excessive watering, excessive fertilizing. Um, not all of those are cultural, but several of them are, or maybe even environmental. And so we want to be sure that what we're seeing in the plant, um, what the plant is expressing to us that, um, you know, there's obviously a problem there. We want to be sure that we did not cause the problem. And it is, in fact, caused by pests. You would be amazed at the um, plants that we get into our plant clinic um, or our turf clinic that actually it's just really a, a variation of, you know, mismanagement or cultural practices that have gone wrong. So inter integrated pest management, and this is a fantastic, um, you know, policy that really the UFIFS teaches, and we teach it to landscapers, homeowners, and uh, students, and really anyone who's going to be handling pests. So what I'm going to do is dive into a nice overview of integrated pest management. We're going to talk about preventing insects. We're going to talk about those cultural practices that I mentioned so that we can keep pests at bay uh, with what practices we're doing in our yard. We're going to talk about biological control, so maybe using insects to control other insects, physical methods, and then chemical methods. And you can see um, here in the picture, I have, it's really a triangle. So we want to start with those cultural practices that are going to be so important to the health of our, our landscape, that day in, day out health of our landscape. When we're talking about, you know, right now we're, you know, having to, to mow the lawn maybe weekly. We're having to pull weeds. We're having to, you know, do those cultural practices. And then you kind of gradually get to that conventional pesticide treatment. Um, so there's a lot of steps we take before we get to that you know, arsenal of um, various chemicals that we might, you know, utilize on our, our, our landscape. We want to use these other methods first. So I'm going to take you on this integrated pest management journey. So again, um, we want to start with the foundation of Florida-friendly landscaping, which is right plant, right place. So we want to think about, you know, the various aspects of our site. What's the soil like? What's the pH? Um, what's the water? Um, you know, does the water flow over our lawn and, and, and drain in or does it tend to kind of stagnate? Do we live in a wet area? Um, some parts of Seminole County are very wet. Um, you know, what's the sun throughout the year? Is it getting six or more hours of light, which is considered full sun? Or is it getting less than three hours where it's a really shady environment? So we want to make sure that we're starting with right plant in the right place, because if we have the wrong plant in the wrong place, it's going to rapidly start to decline. And then that's when the pests really start to move in. We want to scout and identify plants um, for pests. So that means going out into the landscape, looking under leaves, you know, looking at the bark, looking at the soil, looking at the mulch, um, you know, thinking about how the organisms are interacting with your landscape and actually looking for those insects. We wanna avoid plant stresses. So I mentioned turf height. So for those of you that do have turf, um, you know, you wanna make sure that you're mowing it to a proper height. I know in this time where it's growing like gangbusters, uh, you know, we wanna just scalp it and, and take it down to the least amount. But when we don't mow properly or we don't, don't prune properly, we can really stress out our plants. And so it's important to, to make sure that you're meeting those plants' needs. And UF IFAS has a lot of great recommendations on those. We want to use the least toxic alternatives. So, you know, here I have pictured like neem oil, um, and we'll get into those. And we want to apply the pesticides correctly. So integrated pest management, um, you know, is also about setting realistic expectations. 
it's not legitimate for us to say, okay, we're not going to have any bugs in the landscape. You know, this is Florida and we just, you know, insects are a natural part of that ecosystem. So, you know, lots of animals feed on the insects like bats and birds and, um, you know, different types of other insects like this praying mantis. So some damage to your plants is natural, you know, um, accepting that if it's just a couple of leaves, you know, if it's not declining the plant um, towards death, then, you know, we want to make sure that we're um, you know, accepting that as a natural part of the ecosystem, and we're not striving for a pest-free or bug-free yard. Um, instead, having a, a realistic threshold for plant damage or insects is reasonable. So again, for our first line of defense, we're looking at right plant, right place. We want to select pest-resistant plants. So lots of Florida friendly and native plants are already evolved to, to work with the existing insects um, that we have here in Florida. Most plants can withstand small pest populations. Um, you know, like it's just part of, you know, we get colds every now and again and we get stronger, you know, after we have it. So um, least toxic alternatives. So we have horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps bio uh, rationals such as BT, which is a bacteria that actually gets into the gut of say caterpillars or um, other you know types of caterpillars, things like that. And it, it makes them sick and they die. So we can actually use bacteria or um, different things such as parasitic nematodes, mentioned ladybugs and wasps um, to help that balance remain. But we do have a little outbreak um, you know, it's it's not too big of a deal, but then we also have these beneficial insects that are going to help us keep them in check. Um, you know, maybe even just using, uh, you know, the squishing method or your pruners or, um, you know, shoes to be able to help to reduce that population if it's not that big. We want to inspect the lawn and the landscape. So we talked about scouting. Um, we don't want to try to predict that pest. Um, or, or assume that they are present. So when we do routine pesticide application, we're not identifying the insect and we're assuming that all the insects that are in the landscape are bad. But we want to, you know, actually identify these insects, go out there and figure what, figure out what they are. So, um, you know, there might not even a, be a pest problem. We want to make sure that, you know, if there is a problem that we're, we're handling it properly. We want to know our plants. So a lot of the times, you know, it's not only identifying the bugs and the insects, but it's also understanding our plants that, you know, most of the year at the end of my tomato season, I'm probably going to get spider um, spider mites. And, you know, it's kind of a natural decline. It tells me, okay, this is probably the end of the tomato plant's life. So, you know, after growing certain plants over a long time, you know that, well, okay, it's starting to end its life cycle, or maybe it's just a natural seasonality thing um, that usually it clears up. And a lot of the times, um, you know, people come into our plant clinic and our recommendation is do nothing. So just wait it out. Um, you know, again, it's case by case, but a lot of the time we do make that recommendation because it might be a certain seasonality um, or it might just be time for the plant to um, end its life cycle. So some pl plants are sensitive to, to certain products as well. So um, scouting. So when you're scouting, you might see a lady, lady beetle eating some aphids. Um, you might see different insects in the, in the actual landscape. But if you're not monitoring, you're just not going to know what's going on. And so you won't know what the problem is to be able to provide the appropriate solution. Want to look for favorable conditions for pests, signs of symptoms and, you know, disease, um, symptoms of pests, so maybe some chewing. Um, you want to look for the actual pests and the damage to the plant. So maybe leaf spot or leaf curl. Uh, maybe the edges of the plant are missing. Maybe the interior of the plant is becoming translucent. A lot of those things can key you into the, the, the mouth parts or the, the feeding parts of the um, insect. And then that's going to help you better identify what the problem is. You also want to look for the presence of their natural enemies. 
So, um, you know, you might want to look for uh, certain excretions or things that would indicate what kind of insects um, are existing there. So I mentioned cultural practices. So feel free to put in the chat, but we have this picture here on the right. Can anybody tell me what might be the cultural practice that we're seeing here that's not appropriate? Um, feel free to just dive right into the chat box and let me know what you think. Um, in the meantime, I'll talk about the cultural practices themselves. So we want to avoid problems with insects and diseases by properly designing, installing, and maintaining our landscape, landscapes. So stress plants are absolutely more susceptible to being attacked by pests. And they're actually um, starting to do better science on how does that happen. Um, but essentially what they've been finding is that the plant will emit certain um, kind of like pheromones. And so they basically said, hey, I'm, I'm starting to die. I'm stressed. And so then the predators start to move in um, where a healthy plant might not be kind of advertising that. Um, stress plants are just more, more susceptible. So an example might be a Chinese elm with the crowded roots um, shown here. So basically this, this um, little basket or uh, planter box is planted far too high. So the trunk of the base of the tree is actually below um, closer to the turf line. And so what we're seeing is the base of the tree is completely covered in soil and plants. So there's probably a lot of rotting occurring around the trunk of this tree. If we walk up to this tree and we're seeing insects and decline and problems, the first thing that we can notice is that this, this, is, this needs to be cleared. Uh, the soil needs to be cleared away and the planter box likely needs to be removed because the, the several, um, you know, six inches, maybe to even to a foot of the tree is in the soil, which is not good. So the roots need to be in the soil, but you really want to see that root flare coming off of the tree so that, um, you know, you know that the bark's not being smothered and girdled. Um, so other cultural practices, when we have a susceptible host, so is the plant well suited to the environment? So again, we talked about the light. So if it's a full sun needing plant, if we plant it in the shade, like we do see a lot with our turf, um, you know, it might not be so happy. Is the water requirement. So if it's a native aquatic plant and we try to put it in our landscape, because I know I love the beautiful swamp hibiscus. I'm in love with those flowers, but if I tried to plant them in my yard, I would, you know, it would rapidly decline. Now I can plant them in pots so that they have the water that they need um, or find solutions potentially. But um, if that plant is in a dry landscape, it's just not going to do well. Um, some plants are perfectly fine with low levels of nitrogen or phosphorus, while other plants might need you know, additional nutrition. And some plants might like soil that has a higher pH or a lower pH. So without doing a soil test, we wouldn't really know what nutrients or pH that we have going on in our soil and what might be upsetting our azaleas or our blueberries or different, you know, maybe other native plants. So um, it might be the right plant for the right place, but it isn't being cared for properly. That's also another option that um, you know, certain species will put in and they get hedged all the time where they're really meant to grow um, into a tree shape. So that constant pruning can cause different, you know, viruses and um, bacteria to move into the plant and then it will start to decline. Um, is it a problem plant to begin with? So again, you know, maybe it's not a plant that's really well suited for our our USDA zone or our subtropical environment in Central Florida, or if you're elsewhere in Florida. Uh, pest problems are a symptom. So we're gonna look for the true cause of the pest trouble. And many pest problems are a symptom of improper growing conditions and cultural practices. So again, those cultural practices, it's the foundation of the, the pyramid, of the integrate, in, um, integrative pest management period, uh, pyramid, excuse me. 
So we also want to be sure that we're watering wisely. We want to water during the early morning before, um, you know, if you are using an irrigation or hand watering, it's best to water at about 7 a.m., um, definitely before 10 a.m. Because after 10 a.m., we're in the heat of the day, we're losing the water. Um, and after in the afternoon, um, you know, maybe at four o'clock, it becomes more acceptable again. But when we water in the afternoon, we're going to have that water resting uh, on the plant throughout the night. We're not getting that evaporation that occurs during the day. And so that water can lead to more fungal, you know, issues with our plants. So we want to water in the morning. We want to avoid irrigation overhead of the woody ornamentals. So if you have an established plant that um, has been there for you know over a year, then you really don't need to be irrigating it much at all if it's a native or a Florida friendly plant. So we definitely recommend you know recalibrating that initial irrigation, but also we don't want to be watering the leaves. Water on the leaves when it's you know left over time or you know constantly reoccurring like you would with a, a routine irrigation can actually inhibit um, you know, and leave water residue and again, fungus on the, the healthy plant leaves. Um, so many foliar diseases can actually get into the leaf through that water um, coating that they're having from the irrigation. So, um, you know, another thing is uh, overhead irrigation, excessive watering, you know, can lead to that um, uh, entomosporum leaf spot on red tips. So you can see here in the picture, it's definitely had too much irrigation. And once we do this over time, you know, the health of the plant is really declining. And so, you know, at a certain point, it's just time to, to change the plant. You know, it, there's, once cultural practice practices go so far, we start to have, you know, demise to a point where we can't just turn the irrigation off or re remediate it. Um, in some cases, that will help, but in others where it's just gone too far, where the, the, the decline has gone too far and then the insects move in, you know, it's just not going to help the plant. So, you know, thinking about have the growing conditions changed, and that could even be seasonally. So maybe you were using an irrigation system and, um, and then, you know, the rains came in and you didn't recalibrate your irrigation well, that's going to be kind of problematic because now you're getting, you know, the irrigation water and the seasonal rains. And a lot of times it can just be too much water for the plants. Uh, ventilation. So improper airflow can promote fungal growth. So we see this a lot in greenhouses, but it can happen if things are planted really densely. A lot of the times, um, you know, people want to see dense vegetation, even when it's a new landscape. And so they'll plant a lot really close together, but then as stuff starts to mature and grow up, then, you know, that's when we start to get issues of, um, you know, not good ventilation or airflow around the leaves. And then sanitation. So we want to definitely clean all of our tools. So right now, obviously, hand washing is, is on everybody's mind, but good sanitation in the garden is really important, too. Because when we're pruning and, um, you know, going from plant to plant, we can actually be spreading bacteria or viruses um, from the various plants. And we definitely don't want to do that. So making sure that you sanitize your tools is really important. And that you don't use contaminated soils or containers for healthy plants without sanitizing them first. And obviously this is really important in a high volume, maybe more nursery-like setting. Um, but definitely even in our, our landscapes, it can be important. And then attracting beneficial insects. So Native Plant Society, you guys are great at this. Um, planting native plants just draws in so many beneficial insects. You know, our wildflowers, um, all of our native flowering species really do a lot for bringing in those beneficial insects. So again, we want to avoid broad spectrum pesticides, but also providing that food, that nectar, the pollen, and the diversity of plants. So not only the species diversity that you guys are familiar with, but also the diversity of texture, diversity of color, um, diversity of height. You know, those are just other things to think about when you're planning your landscape that can really um, be attractive to different animals that they might say, okay, well, um, you know, this 
foliage is going to be something that I can roost in, but this nectar is going to be something that I can subsist off of. So, you know, thinking about um, diversity of, of lots of different things for plants and provides shelter, of course. So um, as we move up the triangle, so that was all pretty much cultural practices, things that we can do to prevent insect outbreaks in our yard. But when we think about the next level of biological control, how can we um, foster these predators in our yard? So some of the things I have pictured here is the assassin bug nymph. Um, assassin bugs are, you know, just like their name indicates, they actually go around and will, you know, kill insects. And then typically what they'll do is they'll put them on their back. And so um, sometimes they'll just be walking around with dead insects on their back. It's quite interesting under a microscope. Um, and so, you know, that's a good bug. That bug is going to be doing a great service for our little microbiome that we have um, in our landscape. A uh, big-eyed bug. So these are actually raised commercially to control whiteflies, spider mites, aphids, caterpillars, and thrips. And then predatory mites. So these are actually going around eating, um, you know, different maybe other mites or maybe larvae, things like that. So in general, predators are present in relatively fewer numbers than their prey, just like we saw with the wolves. Um, but they are larger, faster, more aggressive than their prey as well. So if you think about the assassin bug versus maybe an aphid, aphid you know, aphids always just look like little mangoes to me. They're just waiting to be plucked, you know, um, where the assassin bug, you know, they, they have some serious um, mandibles. And so, you know, really starting to get into the insect world, understanding them a little bit better, and now understanding that predators exist among orders and species. And, um, you know, it's not confined to just beetles or um, things like that, that we have insects in, in various, you know, aspects of our insect world. Um, one quick tip too on identifying your insects is getting a little hand lens. And I know a lot of you in the Native Plant Society are familiar with those um, to get in there and look at the, the anthers and stamens of the, of the flowers, but it can be really helpful in looking at our insects as well. So something to consider if you don't have a microscope. Um, talking a little bit more about predators. So they can kill large numbers of prey. So think about this spider you know, overnight, it might kill several insects in its web. They're generalists rather than specialists. So they tend to be open to eating, you know, really whatever they can get their hands on. Um, similar to our larger predators, like, you know, again, the wolf. Um, often they're social creatures, but not always. So, um, you know, wasps, ants, um, you know, even things like that. So um, they can also be pests. I've get, gotten questions, how can I eradicate wasps? But um, so if they're, you know, right by your front door, obviously it's a problem. But if they're kind of back and set in, you know, the back of your landscape, you might consider, as long as it's not a exorbitantly large colony, um, you know, maybe leave them so that they can actually do some pest control in your landscape. So parasites. Um, parasites are very specialized. So here you can see, um, you know, this uh, caterpillar is being parasitized by some kind of larvae. Um, so the host, um, well, it, the caterpillar is the host and the, the mother laid the eggs um, in the caterpillar. And as they emerge, you know, they obviously, the caterpillar dies. So there's um, very specific um, parasite relationships, just like we would see with you know, dogs and fleas and things like that, malaria and mosquitoes, you know, and, and humans and things like that. So, um, you know, you, they're often very specialized. They're often very small. Um, and, but you can look for, you know, trail of bodies or maybe exit holes on the organism. Um, and these are always fun when we get these into the extension office. That's like, what's this, what is this weird thing in my yard? Um, and also color changes. So as um, the aphids get parasitized, they start to become, you know, they're no, long, no longer little mangoes. They become kind of brown and, and start to, to decline. Um, talking a little bit more about biological control. So we have those pathogens. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about um, 
bacteria and fungi and viruses, and they're not limited to the the, the animal kingdom. But they do like to parasitize plants and um, you know to to harm plants. So they're naturally occurring um, in diseases. They're often specific to the host. And there can be a lag time. So, um, you know, a lot of us are learning a lot more about viral diseases now um, with COVID. And so similar to where somebody can be carrying COVID, but not necessarily you know, symptomatic, it can be the same with our plants. We can have a lag time that it may take a, a few days to, to kind of show symptoms. Once we see those symptoms, we can issue the treatment. Um, once we've identified it correctly, and it can also take a lag time to, you know, for the control to start to work as well. It's not as um, maybe uh, quickly as, say, squishing a bug type of thing. So we want to allow time for the BT, um, you know, to, to get in there and to work. So again, the BT is a bacterium that kills caterpillars when they ingest it. So you kind of have to allow for that to, the, the ingestion to happen for the bacteria to take place into the gut of the caterpillar and then eventually for the caterpillar to, to die. So just some food for thought. Um, you know, you guys are great at fostering native plants in your yard. So things like gallardia and milkweeds, you know, a lot of these fragrant and flowering plants can attract the natural enemies to pests. Um, you know, so, or they can deter it. So, um, you know, we actually did, some preliminary research uh, when I was at the Arboretum where we looked at how sage might, um, different types of, of sage and the repelling power of the sage might actually keep the insects from attacking the cabbage. And so intermixing different species, the robust, you know, robustness of the herb that we typically enjoy can sometimes deter those pests flowering, um, you know, parts of the, the plants, the goldenrods, the echinacea, sunflower, are going to bring in those beneficial insects. So, um, and then fixing nitrogen. Nitrogen is important for most all plants. And so we want to enhance that nitrogen by adding legumes like clover into our landscape. So now we're graduating to physical methods where um, you know, we're removing the pests by hand. We're removing the infested parts of the plant. So say you go out to your, your tree and you're noticing, um, you know, an infestation on your shrub about, you know, on one of the branches. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem seasonal. It seems like, you know, maybe there's some issues. So maybe we just put that branch right off, throw it into the trash so that we're, you know, effectively killing the insect, um, you know, and maybe squish it, things like that. Um, we're establishing barriers to prevent pests access to the plant. So, um, you know, obviously this is used very easily in the greenhouse setting where they literally put up, you know, greenhouse walls to, to be able to inhibit the pests from entering. Um, and then here you can see the yellow sticky trap. These are good for helping with identifying as well. So not only does it catch the insects and um, your good old fashioned fly trap, you know, that you can get at the at the basic store, um, you know, where it's it's catching that fly and it's not going to bother you once it lands on there. Same thing with these yellow sticky traps, you know, they're they're attracted to the yellow, they land on it. Um, it's not only effective in controlling the population, but then we can identify what is on there. And then chemical methods. So these are going to be a last resort. Um, sometimes major, major pest damage reaches a level that's unacceptable, you know, to the observer. And um, if all previous management efforts have been ineffective, individuals may wish to apply chemical methods. Um, the least sustainable method, because again, you know, you can have that kind of pesticide resistance, you can have the dependency on pesticides. It often, often may require multiple treatments. So, um, you know, it is a last resort option, and that's always what we teach our homeowners and our landscapers. Um, there's no insect preventers. So even if you are opting for a chemical control, we really want to acknowledge that, you know, just because we spray today doesn't mean that um, in a week from now, we won't have the same insects return. So there's no, you know, preventers that necessarily can be sprayed. 
Now, if we're planting flowering plants, again, that's going to reestablish the checks and balances of our natural food web. Um, but in terms of chemical application, there isn't one. Want to read the label for appropriate safety and directional use. And then, of course, always store in a cool, dry place away from pets and children. Um, and, you know, really, if you are going to use these chemicals, definitely reading the label is paramount. You want to choose the least harmful pesticide. So, um, you know, using selective pesticides rather than a broad spectrum. So once you know what the insect is and, you know, if, again, you've tried the other methods, we want to use something that's not like a, a Roundup or, well, that's more for, for um, herbs, you know, herbicides. But, um, you know, something like that's going to really kill a wide range of insects. We want to do something that's more uh, specific. So avoid that shotgun approach where, you know, we want to spot treat rather than um, treating the entire yard. So if we know that this little area is kind of having the outbreak or the spider mites or whatever it may be that we want to just, you know, treat that area. We don't want to treat the entire property. And then, of course, like I mentioned, always follow the pesticide label instructions carefully. So each individual um, pesticide label has instructions very specific to that. Um, that pesticide. So we want to make sure that we're reading the label, using it in the proper amounts, and using our personal protective equipment as well. So if it says to, you know, wear a mask or um, gloves or things like that, you know, even if it's a, a you know, an a organic or something like that, you always want to read the label. Make sure you're protecting your, your plants, your environment, and also yourself. So now we're going to look at some common landscape pests. So pathogens. Um, is it a pathogen at all? So it could be abiotic causes. Uh, I just did a irrigation or irritation webinar on Facebook Live about a week or two ago, and we were looking at some things that residents really thought were fungal or pest related, and it was simply just irrigation. So maybe the donut um, around their irrigation got grown over and filled with certain soil. So that irrigation was just not even able to, to come out and, and water the lawn. Um, a simple fix is just, you know, digging it out and, you know, allowing that, that lawn to be, to be irrigated. Um, you know, it could be wilting in, in our shrubs and trees that we're seeing. It might not even actually be a pest. So making sure that it's not um, a biological problem, such as a pathogen, and that it is an abiotic, um, you know, that it might be an abiotic uh, instance of water or other things. And then um, can it be treated and is it practical to spray? So, you know, fall webworms are all the way up in trees and, you know, magnolia scale is also foliar. So some of this stuff is hard to reach. And again, if it's a natural process of our, our you know, magnolia, tr magnolia tree, um, you know, it might be okay. Maybe it's wrong plant, wrong place. I know magnolias range only really come down to just about central Florida. So if you're growing a magnolia in South Florida, it might not really be optimal. And, um, you know, you might have issues with not only uh, wrong plant, wrong place, but reaching to be able to spray at all. So uh, thinking about aphids. So aphids have piercing and sucking mouth parts which allow it to feed on the juices of the plant. So that's gonna leave a very specific look rather than um, you know, maybe some other type of insect that's actually chewing, chewing the plant and eating from the outside. Uh, it causes a, a stunting and curling on the new terminal growth. So that's something that you might see if the new leaves are coming out and they're kind of curled. You might look for aphids on other, other parts of the plant. And they also, um, I mentioned excretions earlier, but ants, um, well, excuse me, aphids excrete a honeydew. So you can see here's the aphid and out of its rear, it's excreting um, a liquid, which is actually um, a very sweet substance that the ants will um, attra be attracted to. And they're, they will almost farm the aphids. It's quite interesting. Um, and then they can also be, Parasitized. So here on the right, we're seeing a little, you know, mummy type thing. Scale insects. So there's two types. There's the soft scale and then the armored scale. 
You're usually going to um, see these, these have uh, piercing and sucking mouth parts and it allows to feed on the plant juices. So similar to those aphids, they're kind of accessing into the leaf, into the stem and getting the juices from the inside of the plant. Soft scales will excrete a honeydew as well. So also attracting ants. And then um, you might see some uh, spots as well. Um, we'll also see a sooty mold when we have scale on some plants. So if you're seeing a blackish, looks like a mold, it is a mold, but basically it's usually very associated with that excretion. So you have the scale, which are causing the, the excretion, and then the excretion is feeding this um, sooty mold. And so, you know, again, when we're starting to go down the trajectory, let's back it up. Is it wrong plant, wrong place? And then we're having, you know, this kind of domino effect like we saw in the video. Mealybugs. So these are a soft scale with a piercing sucking mouth, mouth part. They kind of have a cottony appearance. Um, and again, they can be associated with sooty mold. I just recently saw these in my yard. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're around. But it, it didn't, you know, it's not causing a decline to the plant. White flies. White flies also have a piercing sucking mouth part, allowing it to feed on the plant juices. So most of these are, you know, they're getting right into the, the juices of the plant. Um, they're typically infesting the lower leaf structures. So when you're scouting for insects, you might have to look at the lowest um, plant. They're not going to be damaged on the new growing leaves. So when we think about, you know, scouting, we want to look at, um, you know, is it on the new growth? Is it on the old growth? Um, the lower part of the plant, the higher part of the plant. This can all indicate what type of insect species we're, we're needing to treat. Um, also associated with sooty mold, uh, the damaged leaves will appear spotted. Like in this picture here, you can see kind of, it almost looks like a nutrient deficiency, but it's not. So nutrient deficiency is gonna be similar, but it's gonna run uh, kind of more with the veins where this is gonna have more of a spotted look to it. Um, it can transmit plant to plant viruses. So this is kind of like the, the mosquito and the malaria kind of combination uh, of bad for your plant, where if you have white flies, you might also have some viral uh, diseases going along with it. And then Im immature white flies can also cause plant damage. So uh, we're actually doing our bug camp white right now for uh, its entomology camp virtually for high schoolers. And today I taught them about life cycles and life cycles of insects is, is really important because they're weird, wacky and wonderful. They um, vary a lot from species to species, but you know, it's, it's really good to know what life stage the, the insect is in. So that way you can know is, is it a problem or is it not a problem? So for example, caterpillars and butterflies, you know, caterpillars are gonna be eating our vegetation where the butterflies are really just nectaring and you know not really showing any damage. So knowing where the insect is in its life cycle can help us better treat, um, can help us better understand what damage we're seeing in the landscape. So I mentioned spider mites. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with these. If you grow tomatoes, you probably are too. Uh, spidey mite, spider mites are very, very tiny. They have, a, again, a piercing and sucking mouth part. They are a true mite. They have the eggs, the caskins, the webs um, visible, all with the hand lens. If you're looking without the hand lens, you'll just kind of see, you know, it looks like a spider related thing. Um, but again, they are a mite. It's not a spider web, but you'll start to see it become more dense around the leaves, um, you know, and then the base of the plant. The leaves appear kind of stripped. And a high infestation rate might lead to uh, mite migration. So once they kind of build up their carrying capacity for a certain plant, they're going to move to the next tomato plant, and they're going to kind of keep doing that until they, um, you know, until their population kind of blossoms. Nematodes. So um, nematodes are roundworms. They feed on the root tissues of the plant. Um, so you really wouldn't know per se if you had nematodes um, unless you really dig up the plant and look at the roots. 
So the affected roots are shown here on the left. They have these weird distortions, kind of almost looks like tubers, but not quite, um, kind of knuckly look. And then on the right-hand side, those are the healthy roots where they're just, you know, kind of slender and delicate. Um, so when you pull up, you know, your old, it's the end of the season, end of the spring, end of the summer, you know, you might see, the, see these on your roots. You know, again, it might just be kind of the natural decline, natural end of the life cycle of the plant. Um, you know, especially when we're talking right plant, right place. So if we're trying to grow something that's really only suitable for Florida spring and we're trying to grow it in Florida summer, um, you know, it's not going to do well because of the, the nematodes and the rains and the sun. Um, so we really have to look at if we're planting seasonally, um, you know, we want to make sure it's the right plant, right place. So again, they're usually associated with that dieback and decline um, of plants. But if they do, you know, attack a healthy shrub or, or things like that, you'll see dieback, you'll see the, the chlorosis, and um, the plants will eventually wilt and die. So um, you can tell for sure under a microscope. But again, just looking at the roots once they're dug up, you know, you would know uh, by seeing these kind of almost tuber-like, you know, knotted structures. So thrips, the thrips will feed on the flowers and foliage. They're found on the underside of the leaf. So again, when we're out scouting, we want to look, you know, on the leaves, on the foliage, on the flowers, on the underside of the leaves. Um, their excrement is shiny black. So if you're starting to see that black stuff, um, it's different than sooty mold. Um, the sooty mold just has kind of a, a dusty almost look where this almost looks like it's integrated into the, into the plant itself. Um, it's a little bit more dense looking. Um, they do transmit plant diseases as well. So again, looking at that, you know, kind of stacking of uh, bad uh, insects. Damaged plants will appear um, flecked or bleached. So again, with the black, you can also see where they've been kind of attacking the foliage. And um, they cause leaf and flower distortions and bud drops. So you can see here in this uh, plant here on the right, you can you know see the distorted leaves and it's just not growing properly. So plant diseases arise when we have this trifecta. So you have the plant um, or the host and you know maybe it's the wrong plant in the wrong plate, place. Maybe it, it was actually a healthy plant. Um, then you have maybe some environmental issues going on, maybe cultural issues that start to occur. This could be anything from drought to, you know, uh, again, poor pruning, uh, poor cultural maintenance, um, you know, things like that. Maybe a vine just was overtaking the tree and the tree is not able to photosynthesize. Some kind of environmental or cultural trigger um, happens. And then the pathogen or the pest is able to kind of move in and take advantage of that situation. So the disease occurs when an agent impairs the necessary function of the plant. So leaf spots, um, they can be algal, bacterial, or fungal pathogens. They enter through injured tissues, or again, if it's like a lot of watering, they can kind of enter through that water surface into the leaf. Um, just makes it easier to penetrate. Um, and they're spread by splashing water and insects or maybe even poor, you know, sanitation of your tools and things like that. Root rot. Um, so these are kind of blanket general issues that you might see. Um, root rot is, you know, poor growth, thinning canopy of the tree. Um, you know, if you're seeing just a lack of fleshing out in the springtime, uh, the tree's not really just vigorously growing. There might be some rotting going on in our in our root structure. And so, um, you know, you might see leaf drop or yellowing. The uh, portions of the branch might die. So the tree might still keep holding on, but maybe a branch starts to go. Um, or ultimately, the, the tree might start to go and to die. The roots become dark and rotted. And you can see this from anything from turf through trees. So, you know, anything can get root rot. It's very possible. Um, the roots tend to kind of strip off easily. So 
um, you know, it's almost like a, a coating that you, you know, might just kind of pull off. Uh, they get black and then, you know, the real root is remaining underneath that. And it's usually do, due to excessive soil moisture. So poor drainage, overwatering with our irrigation, planting too deep. So again, that um, tree that we saw that was buried in the planter, there just is not a lot of, you know, um, the water in there is probably tending to stagnate. And so not only are we going to get that um, bark decline, but we're probably going to get some root decline as well. So um, if we're planting it too deep um, or if we have shallow rooting. So that's another problem when we don't water our turf, um, you know, we water it too frequently. We're not encouraging deep root growth. So these summertime rains are fantastic at helping plants to search for water. So we get a lot, a lot of rain. Those roots over the next few days are going to be searching for that water. It's so hot. It's so dry. And then they're growing deep to try to find those reserves. And then we get another deep rain. And so, um, you know, now is a really good time to, to have those roots start to grow deep and pull back on the irrigation so that we're not um, overwatering. Um, you know, once we get root rot, we can have, you know, the tree blow, blow over. Um, you know, obviously the turf starts to decline, the shrub starts to decline. So making sure that your, your tree is happy is really paramount. So some insect management strategies. So sap suckers, um, such as aphids, soft scales, mealybugs, white flies, and spider mites, a lot of those ones that we talk about piercing and sucking mouth parts, you want to look at biological controls. So again, planting our wildflowers, bringing in those beneficial insects is going to be really, really helpful for managing those, um, those sap suckers. The soaps and oils are also good. The insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils, those are going to be great. You can usually find those at the nursery or maybe the, um, the store, um, looking at in, in the different aisles. If we have caterpillars, of course, we have BT. That's a, a great um, bacteria that we can help deter those caterpillars. And then if we have plant chewers, so right now the lover grasshoppers are getting getting pretty sizable, um, you know, and they're starting to chew down some of the some of the plants. If you mind that, then you know maybe using a proctor insecticide, or you know you could use your pruners if you're brave enough. Um, a proper insecticide if the damage warrants action. Now I've actually let the lovers run a course. Um, I've actively watched them in my yard in the entire summer. Now that I'm home much more often, um, just kind of watching them and looking at what they like to eat. So if they like to eat things that I really don't prefer them to eat, um, you know, that might be an issue. But they've been eating my bromeliads. Um, you know, bromeliads are tough as nails. They tend to bounce right back. And so I'm really not worried about those. Um, they also, I think they've chewed on my mulberries, um, the actual vegetation of the mulberry. And, you know, they're hardy trees a few leaves here and there, really not a big deal. So you kind of have to calibrate, you know, what is acceptable to you and what is not. You know, there's plants are very sacred and, and special to us. So, you know, if it's a plant that, um, you know, maybe has a, a significance or a special memory of a friend, um, maybe treatment is, is really, you know, important, an important step of, of preserving that plant. Um, but, you know, if it's just a dime a dozen bromeliad, then, hey, have at it. Have at it, lover grasshoppers. Um, some disease management strategies continuing. So we have leaf spots. Um, so we want to always avoid, avoid overhead irrigation. If you're starting to see kind of rusty spots on your leaves, cut the irrigation, um, convert it to micro, convert it to drip irrigation. Uh, we want to improve the air circulation around the plant. So thinning out, if our hedge is just planted so densely, start to thin that out. We want to remember to sanitize all of our tools because this is something that's going to be transferable inter plant species. So we want to move, remove the infected plant parts and avoid reinfection of that species or to other species. 
um, stem cankers or stem rots. We want to change the watering and the pruning practices as well. Same thing with root rots. Pull back on the watering. Um, could be wrong plant, wrong place if they're not adapted. So some really good aquatic species, obviously, are, are cypress trees are great for a more wet area. Um, you know, you want to remove the infected plant and the roots. Or wilt. Um, you could have basically removing that infected plant. So just to recap, we looked at the integrated pest management in depth in every single part of this pyramid, um, starting off with our prevention and our cultural practices, such as site and plant selection, sanitation, rotations, um, if you're you know, talking vegetables and things like that. Uh, we looked at our physical and mechanical methods, such as the squish method, um, the traps, the barriers and blocks that we use. The biological controls, um, so as we elevate up the pyramid, we're thinking about um, fostering predators, parasites, nematodes, things like that. Chemical control, so thinking about our, our insecticidal soaps, our horticultural oils, um, you know, different things to start to basically kill on contact. And then lastly, we look at our conventional pesticides that, that kill um, the insect. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you all so much for, for uh, listening along with me today. Thank you. It was such, a, as usual, you put together such a fascinating, captivating presentation. And I can't thank you enough for adding those slides with individual pest profiles. That was, you went above and beyond. Thank you so much. So we do have a couple questions. I'm gonna post them onto the screen. Um, this gentleman from um, YouTube has uh, is asking, are there any native insects for carpenter ant control? Ants are a tricky one. Um, ants really are very difficult um, because again, they are a predator and uh, they're social. So they have strength in numbers and they also are actively, you know, um, you know, pre preying on the various other insects. Right. So once they take hold in your landscape, it is very, very, very hard to get rid of them. Um, and so uh, making sure again, that it is uh, an ant, um, not a termite. We do get inquiries about that. Um, seeing where the ants are. So if they're in your house, like uh, I have in my sunroom, you know, um, we want to we want to get rid of them so trying to use something more systemic that's going to attack uh, the queen is going to be really the the important part now if you say well it's right next to my vegetable garden and i don't really want to you know, use those um you know synthetic chemicals uh i understand and last i heard the university of central florida entomologist was looking at um using steam as an effective kill, you know, for ants and ant colonies. So um, definitely hot water, hot boiling water, um, pouring it into where the, the majority of the ants in that nest um, is going to really, really kick them back. Now, it might not be a long-term solution. You might have to do multiple applications, um, but potentially that use in conjunction with maybe a some, um, a systematic herbicide or pesticide might help. Um, you know, a lot of these ants that we have are invasive. Some of them are native, but um, you know, these invasive insects can really do a number for sure. Yeah, uh, folks, thank you so much. Uh, in case you are joining us, if you'd like to donate to our chapter, our little nonprofit, I've just uh, posted our Cash App, Venmo, and PayPal information. If you'd like to become a member, uh, please go to fnps.org. That's Florida Native Plant Society and join. Uh, let's take a few more uh, questions. Gia Lee from Facebook um, wanted to ask you after your presentation about uh, milkweed bugs, uh, the aphids. So she's writing, milkweed is notorious for little mango infestations. Do you have recommendations of plants to pair with milkweed to attract aphid predators or to deter aphids? 
Absolutely. So um, kind of going back to when we look at aphids, um, you know, and I have been growing milkweed as well. And, you know, it they kind of are part of a natural cycling of the milkweed. So, you know, you kind of have some aphids, you might have a few ants. But then if you're getting those butterflies, the butterflies are going to come down and actually mow down that vegetation um, and take the plant all the way down to the ground. And that's that's why we plant milkweed, because we want to help the butterflies. Right. So, um, you know, a couple aphids at the you know, they usually like the nice tender parts at the tips there. Um, you know, not too much of a big deal, especially if you have multiple milkweed plants or multiple milkweed species. Um, but again, to deter aphids, you want to foster the biological um, control. So they're prey species. So um, typically the ants will kind of protect the aphids because they like that honeydew secretion. Right. But other things um, like um, the praying mantis or green lacewing or other predators are going to feed on those aphids, the lady beetle in insects. So if we plant things like wildflowers, um, they're typically going to be attracted to those types of environment. Um, so I would say if you're planting your milkweed, throw in some gallardia, throw in some, um, you know, native wildflowers. And, um, you know, you'll start to see those beneficial lady beetles that really can, can they can eat those mangoes quite quickly. Yeah, it is, I guess it's just a waiting game. So once you plant them, you just have to wait probably until the next season. And of course, you're, you're not using any pesticide. Uh, you're encouraging just a natural ecosystem of plant insect relationships. So you will get eventually the praying mantis and the ladybugs that should take care of your problems. That's Unfortunately, I have, um, do you, can you hear me? She says, thank you, Tina. So yeah, uh, folks, if you have any questions, now's a good time to uh, comment and post them. Tina will be happy to take your questions. Um, yes, I had a question myself, Tina. So I have a cherry laurel and it has bacterial flux, which I kind of pimp, uh, honed down after a couple of Facebook posts, okay, this is what I have. Um, doesn't seem to be causing decline uh, at all. Um, you know, growth in the spring is vigorous. You get fresh new leaves. Um, tree doesn't seem to have any dead twigs or um, any sort of problems, except at the base where you see that uh, sap kind of ooze uh, from time to time. And it's not uh, continuous either. It's just, you know, intermittent. Uh, is this something that is uh, eventually going to kill the tree off? Like, do I need to be a little more preemptive and get the uh, tree removal people here and just get rid of it? Or is this something that I should more worry about once uh, problems become evident? Uh, that's a great question, Mark. Um, and I think that, well, my question back to you is, what's the age of the tree? So how big of a diameter are we talking? Oh, it's probably at least a good 25 years old. Uh, diameter wise, um, it's a split trunk, meaning uh, the trunk split very early on. And unfortunately, I mean, I bought the house after, after the fact. Um, but at the base, I would say it's no more than two and a half feet in diameter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the cherry laurel, you know, typically with the plant community, we see plants that, you know, they say, OK, I'm just I'm here to live on Earth. And I'm, you know, like, for example, uh, a longleaf pine, you know, they're they're long lived or even maybe a live oak where they're going to live, you know, for a long period of time. Um, while maybe minimizing the amount of uh, seeds that they're producing. Where cherry laurel is a, a, a tree that really will produce lots of seeds. Um, and so they might be a little bit shorter lived. Um, their wood might not be as hardy. So another example of that would be like an acer rubrum or red maple tree. Um, they're just going to kind of, you know, grow quickly a lot of offspring, a lot of um, seeds, and then, you know, maybe start to decline. Right. 
Um, 25 years old is not too terribly long. Um, you know, and, you know, sometimes trees can live. They're very good at compartmentalizing these types of wounds or, or things like that. Chero laurel is probably not the greatest at compartmentalizing as maybe say a, a live oak would, where they actually, you know, they always have these wounds. They always have these, um, you know, even if it's a, a pruning or things like that, they don't actually ever get rid of the wound or heal like we do. They will just compartmentalize that wound and then continue to live, um, you know, or if the, the decay spreads and they will decline. But if it looks like your tree has well compartmentalized it, it's not spreading, um, you know, to other parts. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, an analog might be like a wart, you know, you can live with warts, um, you know, they're not going to kill you. But over time, you know, it might start to spread and, and become an issue. But I would just look for those environmental stressors. Okay. So in a drought, you know, you might want to provide a little extra water or, um, you know, if it's just maybe at the end of a, a season, if you're having a lot of, um, you know, maybe a less, less nutrients in your soil that maybe you need to add some compost or things like that to enhance the soil around it. Um, definitely keeping an eye on the tree. I don't think, um, you know, you could definitely send me some pictures, but it doesn't sound like it's something that, you know, is really going to be catastrophic to the tree at this point, um, that you can probably just keep an eye on it. Make sure, you know, if you are seeing signs of um, environmental stressors, so like we have a hurricane coming or, um, you know, drought or other, you know, things like that, you just want to be really careful around the base of that tree and just making sure that that tree stays nice and healthy. Got it. Got it. Thank you, Tina. Folks, if you have any questions, we're wrapping it up. We can take a few more questions. You can please comment in the chat box and we can post them into the live stream. Uh, a user from Facebook writes, what are your thoughts about introducing store-bought lady beetles for aphid management? Is this a good practice or not? Great question, um, Matt. Thank you. So I think um, you know, Mark kind of alluded to it a little bit in the previous question that, you know, when we're talking Florida friendly, when we're talking native cultivation, um, you know, it takes time. We need to be patient. So when they reintroduced those wolves into Yellowstone, the, the beavers did not come back immediately. Um, you know, it had to, this process had to start occurring. And so our homes were built decades ago. They were built, you know, uh, my home was in the 50s, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on. So this land um, where our homes are and our yard essentially has been, you know, kind of devoid of, of an, a, a micro ecosystem, so to speak. And we're trying to foster that. So it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but as you plant Florida friendly plants, native plants, they'll start to see, you know, this ecosystem start to come about. Um, and so, you know, it might take a few seasons, it might take a few years, um, but as you do, you're gonna see, um, see that come to fruition. So basically just be patient, keep planting Florida friendly, keep planting um, great native species. And in time you will have more of a balance and you'll see lots of, um, you know, it'll echo up the, the web. So not only will you see your predator insects, but you'll see, you know, uh, Carolina wrens. Um, I can't tell you how many times the Carolina wrens been in my carport because they love insects and my, my yard's teeming with all different types of insects. And, um, you know, that's really how it, how it starts to stack into the food web. So you're seeing you know, that incremental build over time. And that's the that's the labor of love and the passion that you can create behind it because, you know, you start to really see that um, fostering over the years. And, you know, after a while, even your neighbors, you know, I know my neighbors have said, it's just amazing what change has come since you guys have moved in, you know, because there's, they see more birds, they see more butterflies and, and all the great, great things that we enjoy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, for Native Plant Society is always promoting native plants and gardening. So if we are, as individuals are making that change and, and gardening and uh, gardening with native plants and native wildflowers and hoping that these predatory insects uh, come into place, 
imagine if your neighbor is doing it imagine if your entire neighborhood is doing it or a majority of your neighborhood is doing it it just speeds up that process like tina mentioned if your house is built in the 50s 60s 70s and all that it remains is a gigantic lawn with very few islands of plants that diversify basically your plant portfolio then you might wait a little bit longer but if you have others joining up and banding together and planting plants for biodiversity that will speed up the return of these beneficial insects back into your yard um, so uh, matt writes thank you so much uh, rory writes he's our uh, our in-house comedic relief but rory has a good point he says that lady but lady beetles may be shipped from us from a different state and they may not have be a good fit for um florida in case people are wondering what mosquito county is back in the day orange county was known uh, previously before it got named as orange county as mosquito county so rory and it included guy. seminole too yes it did yeah, Seminole just recently split off from Orange back in the 1990s. So when, as our population grew, it, it was a government decision to best manage our, uh, our populations separately. So anyways, thank you so much, Tina. Thank you so much for your time on a Monday night. I appreciate it as always. And for those of you who are joining us, thank you again for tuning in and we will see you uh, next month with um, Allegra Beyer and Amanda Lindsay about uh, SISMA and natural lands here in Seminole County. All right. Yeah, and actually, I just wanted to do a, a quick plug. I'll actually be doing a webinar with Amanda Lindsay this Thursday, uh, July 16th. I'll put the link to register in the chat. If you guys are interested, um, please feel free to, to register. Uh, I just put in the Zoom link. It'll be Thursday sure. at three o'clock and Amanda Lindsay and I will be talking invasive species. Um, I believe Allegra Byer is also going to join us just real quick. And um, so, yeah, we're okay. we're happy to to be working together with all the same people. Yeah, I'm super excited. That only uh, makes the uh, presentation with us in August better because they'll always already have practice with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have one last question from Leah. She writes, do you have advice for squash bugs? Okay, so I'm not familiar with squash bugs, but by squash bugs, I think you mean bugs that you usually see on squash plants. Right. So that usually is like caterpillars. And for caterpillars, um, what I recommend is that BT, that Bacillium thuringiensis. It's a bacteria that um, doesn't harm humans at all, but it gets into the gut of the caterpillar and it does kill them. So um, you can use that BT on um, you know, any of your squash plants and um, just follow the label and it should help with reducing that caterpillar population. Now, now is not a good time to really be growing squash. Um, if you're starting it from seed, maybe, um, but typically we grow squash in the springtime in Florida, in central Florida. So um, just be mindful of when you're planting that squash. Typically we're not as like um, on the same pumpkin train as the rest of the country where we're harvesting um, fall pumpkins. So usually our, our squashes come in, in springtime, um, but just make sure you're planting at the right time of year as well. Yes, very good point, solid point. So Tina, if you'd like to share that link with me, if you'd like to email it to me, I can uh, put it in our website and promote it Great. that way as well. Yes, I put it in the chat. I don't know, can you see it? Um, yes, I believe so. Yes, I found it. Let me post it right now. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And Tina, again, I'm indebted for your time. You have been thank just, you. just a wonderful person to know. So thank you again. And bye for now, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all.